9, 12, 10, 28, 2, 23. This is Deep State Radio. Hello and welcome to DSR. I'm David Rothkopf, your host, and each and every week we talk about big stories in the world. Of course, this week that means a discussion about uh, Syria and its ramifications for the region and the world. We're joined by our uh, uh, regulars, uh, upon whom we cannot proceed without, uh, uh, Rosa Brooks of Georgetown University Law Center. How are you doing, Rosa? I'm very well. Thank you, David. A bad day for Bashar al-Assad is sort of a good day for pretty much everybody else. Uh, well, that's we, we, we will uh, we will explore that concept in a moment. And Corey Shockey of American Enterprise Institute, how are you doing, Corey? I am exceedingly well, thank you, David. Uh, excellent. And we are joined by an old friend and an expert in the region that we're talking about, Stephen Heidemann. He's the Janet Wright Ketchum 1953 Chair in Middle East Studies at Smith College and a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy of the Brookings Institution. How are you doing, Steve? Very well, David. I'm really pleased to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. There's clearly a lot to talk about. And uh, Steve, why don't we start with you and let me give you a kind of a general question, which probably will take the entire 30 minutes to answer. But uh, uh, clear, I've watched some of your social media responses. Clearly what's happened in Syria is um, remarkable. Um, uh, and the question is, what are we to make of it at this point? Well, We've seen Syria shift from a country that has been trapped in a, in a rather brutal civil war for the past 13 years to one that is in the very, very first days of a political transition, the outcome of which is still uncertain, but which holds some promise, I think, for opening, opening the door to what could be a much brighter future for Syria and for Syrians who who have lived for, for more than the past 50 years under one of the most repressive dictatorships in the world. So this is a very exciting moment. It's a moment that's, you know, fraught with possibility, but also with risk. And we're watching closely to see how these early phases of the transition uh, in Syria unfold, understanding that what happens now will be important in shaping whatever pathway Syria follows over the coming months and years. You know, one of the comments that I saw on Twitter, I actually saw several versions of this, not Twitter, because I don't go to Twitter, Blue Sky, um, was, uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for telling us this can go in a variety of directions, but we're Syrians, and for the moment, just allow us to be happy that Assad is gone, and we will right. get to this. You know, we 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 know that there, this moment is fraught. Corey, do you have a comment on this, or you can even pose a question to Steve? You know what? After enduring a civil war for 13 years that started with peaceful protests for political reform, I totally understand Syrians thinking, let us just have a moment of breathing in the air of Assad gone and, and watching prisons be opened and families reunited with political prisoners before they have to figure out what's going to be a very difficult thing to figure out. I, I think that no, I was Go just on. going to say, I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and one of the most emotional things about what's happened in the past few days has been talking with Syrian friends and hearing their, their just extraordinary joy and excitement about the overthrow of the Assad regime. Uh, an old friend who's close to the Syrian opposition called and, and was crying on the phone saying, we're free, we're free. We never thought we'd get here, but now we're free. And so it is important that we, we give Syrians the space to experience that happiness, even if we recognize that at the same time, the politics are never going to fully disappear. Rosa, comment or question? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, the other day, I've lost track of time, so I don't even remember which day it was anymore, but um, 
I, I hadn't been, I hadn't looked at the newspaper. I'd had a busy morning. And when it finally was, you know, two or three in the afternoon uh, here in the East Coast in the U.S., and I glanced at the front page of the New York Times and the headline said, uh, Bashar al-Assad flees to Russia. I just had a moment of just, oh, thank God. You know, and it reminded me of all those other moments and obviously, you know, a thousand times more intense for for Syrians. Um, you know, the the with the moment when the statue of Saddam Hussein was toppled in Baghdad, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, these symbolic moments of just just the sense of this terrible weight lifting. And, and even though we know that sometimes there are difficult and terrible things still to come that that. Yeah, taking taking a minute to enjoy that that moment. Um, you know, I, I I was in Baghdad in the the summer of two thousand three, um, right before sort of everything went right back to hell. Um, and it was I remember just this, still a moment. You know, going to see a visit a Iraqi NGO that had liberated from secret police headquarters all the files of these prisoners who had been tortured and murdered by the regime, and they they had literally brought them out with bulldozers and they were kind of piled in this basement and and just looking at these piles, these photos of all these mostly young men who dead, dead and tortured young men and just just the sense of just the unbelievable human cost uh, and how much had been endured and, you know, how much suffering and misery and just that that sense of, uh, you know, no matter even recognizing all the extraordinarily difficult and possibly bad things to come. Just that that moment of that that turning point, that sense of change and possibility, it, it's real. Yeah, you know, I think that's a an, an interesting comment. Uh, and I'll see you your Baghdad, and I'll raise you by thirteen years, Beijing, because I was in Beijing. Of course, I was extremely young in nineteen eighty nine, in the days before the Tiananmen Square uprising, and literally everybody in China was exulting the possibility of some kind of change. Uh, I was actually, I was sharing, an, it was in an office that was uh, run by a company, con company entity that was controlled by the government. And all the Chinese Communist Party officials were going down to Tiananmen Square to sort of celebrate. And you sort of saw in a moment like that, like you see in the streets of Syria, the, the feelings of the people, the spirit of the country, and that's not something to minimize. But Steve, we've also seen something else in the wake of this, um, which is frantic activity by other governments in and about it. And I think that reveals the importance of Syria as a strategic country in the region and as a bridge between parts of the region. Um, and, you know, there have been all sorts of lists and quick takes offered. Iran is a loser. Russia is a loser. Turkey is a winner. The Gulf states don't know what to do. The Israelis are going to go and take a little bit of land to protect themselves. The U.S. is going to help them and get rid of ISIS. Everybody in the world is, to, even the EU is saying, you know something, we're not taking any more Syrian refugees for a while. That there's been all of this activity around it. What does that tell you about what's likely to happen next? Well, it seems to me that we could well be on, on the cusp of maybe the biggest reshaping of the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. And that, that wow. activity that, yeah, that activity that you're talking about, I think uh, underscores this scramble in world capitals to try to take stock of, of just where we are, of where we might be headed. And how to position themselves in, in response. You know, Iran for 20 years has been building its presence as a major regional power after the U.S. toppled Saddam Hussein and removed this bulwark against Iran's expansion into the Eastern Arab world. And the Arab world, uh, uh, on the opposite side has been trying for decades, along with the U.S., to pull Assad out of the Iranian orbit and, and, and persuade, uh, Assad to return to the Arab fold. And now we're seeing, you know, as in the course of just a couple of months, mostly because of the fall of Saddam, the rollback of Iran's position in the region, the potential for Arab states in the region and for the U.S. to realize this longstanding aim of, of Syria's return to the Arab fold, the possibility that a refugee problem that has left 7 million Syrians 
in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Europe has a million at least, able to return. All of these things, I think, have really forced governments in the region and, and around the world to move very quickly to figure out what their own policies ought to be now that these circumstances have changed so dramatically. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, of all the moving parts uh, that, that seem really significant here that we can predict about, because the Russians look like they may keep their bases there and, you know, presumably at some point the Israelis will go back to where they were. Um, uh, Corey, the two that seem to me to be most significant in the, in the context of the region are the, 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 the series of enormous blows Iran has suffered in the course of the past couple of months and got with Hamas, with Hezbollah, and now in Syria. Um, and potentially the increase as, as their influence has declined, uh, of influence of Turkey. What, what do you think of that, Corey? And you may have a follow up. Well, it's not clear to me what Turkey's influence is going to be once the dust settles, but I think they have always been um, incredibly consequential. And so um, I think there's the possibility for lots of bad behavior by lots of regional powers. And uh, we and the Turks have never found a common approach to Syria. Right. We continue to believe that Kurdish fighters are really important for the management of ISIS. And Turkey feels incredibly threatened by that. I think that's going to have to come to a head pretty quickly. Um, and it's not at all clear that other regional powers are going to let Turkey influence uh, events in Syria towards a sort of Muslim Brotherhood future. I'd be super interested to know from Steve how he thinks we ought to think about whether the HST is moderating at all. Yeah, well, you make some really important points, too, uh, uh, about what I, I think we could really call a, a, a struggle, a new struggle for Syria that's that's about to to get underway between regional actors, Turkey, uh, external powers like the United States you know, Syria has always been an object of competition between external actors. President Erdogan has already kind of laid down a marker that he expects Turkey to be uh, the, the lead actor in shaping Syria's future. And, and, and as you noted, Corey, that that could lead to some friction with the U.S. if if he decides to play favorites with some Islamist uh, actors that we might not view so favorably. The question of the Kurds is a huge one. And we, we have to recognize that, that influential Gulf countries like Qatar and the UAE have pursued quite different agendas in, in Syria, and, and Saudi Arabia has as well. So the potential for all kinds of friction around, around Syria's future is, is very much alive, I think. <laughs> Rosa is uh, in a part of uh, the... DC area where the weather seems to be having her flickering in and out. Uh, I, I, I hope you can uh, hear me here, I Rosa. I can hear you. You know, one, yeah. one thing that struck me is the swiftness which which the United States and the Israelis just felt complete license to bomb whatever they wanted to in the region. Um, and I was just wondering what your reaction was to well, that. Well, I hadn't noticed us. You know, there back in the past um, either, to be honest. I mean, we've always felt complete license to bomb whoever we wanted, uh, whenever we wanted in Syria. So um, I don't know that that's different. I mean, obviously for the Israelis, they they seize the opportunity, um, you know, and it's not it clearly, uh, you know, not just about, about potentially an additional land buffer, but also about uh, trying to take action to destroy as much military capability as they can on the grounds that right now it's chaos, they have an opportunity. Who knows whose hands it falls into? Uh, if they can, if they can take it out of commission, why not do that? And and um, uh, for once, I can't say I blame them uh, on that one. What, what do you think, Steve? Well, I I I, I wonder um, whether the five hundred or so airstrikes that Israel has launched against military assets in Syria 
will really end up having any kind of, of constructive impact on, on longer term dynamics in the region. There's uncertainty about what the next government in Syria will look like. There are questions about how it might use the military assets that it inherited from the Assad regime before they were destroyed by, by Israel. But it seems clear that what Israel's acts will, will do as a consequence is cement uh, a fairly deep relationship of hostility and antagonism between Israel and whatever new government emerges in Syria. And if we think back to 2010, to the period in which the U.S. was very close to brokering a deal between uh, Bashar al-Assad and Netanyahu for the return of the Golan Heights, for uh, a, a peace uh, peace treaty between Israel and Syria, this kind of preemptive uh, attack uh, by Israel would would seem to signal that either you know Israeli leaders don't feel that there's any possibility of that kind of of movement uh, in, in the near future or that they're they're just so deeply uncertain about HTS and and David you had asked about how it's changed and I definitely avoided that question maybe we can come back to it <laughs> but but um but but you know they 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 feel confident enough that HTS has not distanced itself uh, enough from its jihadist uh, incarnations to feel that they want any of those weapons in in Syrian hands. Can, can but we, the can possibility now is that. It, can 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 we push? I'm on sorry. That? Go ahead. Can 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 we push you on that though? Because I that that, that to me sure. is the big question. Do you think that they're that the Israelis are mistaken to start from the assumption? You know, forget it. They're not going to be our friends no matter what. I mean, do you do you think there there was a chance? maybe even still is, or at least was a chance of some, uh, if not rapprochement, uh, you know, live and let live Pacific relationship between the Israelis and the current crew, assuming the current crew remains in control in Syria. Mm. Can I pile on to that question? Sure. To ask um, Steve, your judgment about whether HST will actually end up Right. in control of the country? Right. Yeah, I mean, th- those are all good questions. Rosa, just to follow up on on, on your question, you know, it, I don't think there's any question that HTS, like the opposition as a whole, is deeply nationalist. I, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of observers made is concluding that because they were opposed to Assad, they might not be as committed to outcomes like the return of the Golan as the Assad regimes over time had been. I, I think that's wrong. So they're clearly Arab nationalist. I, I don't view them, however, as having held on to the more extreme, violent, jihadist outlooks that defined HDS in its earlier incarnations. They're clearly Salafist. They're fundamentalist Muslims. They're not Democrats. But I, I do think that they have shown a very deep, pragmatic streak. David, you mentioned that Russia might be able, and it looks like it will be able to hold on to its bases at Hemem, the airfield, and the the naval facility uh, in Tartus, you know, that clearly is developing through conversations between Russian officials and HDS, in which despite Russia's role in in supporting the the Assad regime, uh, there seems to be some understanding that there are benefits for HTS of not rupturing that relationship altogether. And if they're willing to show that kind of pragmatism toward one of their really most um, determined adversaries, it, you have to think that it's not impossible that there could have been, over time, some attempt to reach an accommodation with Israel. And I think that's been made less likely because of, of, of Israel's uh, actions. Um, Corey, could you repeat your question? Yeah, um, how likely do you think it is that HTS will, at the end of the day, uh, yeah. be able to control the country? Uh, I'm I'm actually a little nervous at the moment about the extent to which HTS has imposed itself as the dominant actor in this transition. Um, HTS has appointed a member of its political wing, the Syrian Salvation Government, as the prime minister of a caretaker uh, authority in Syria now. And the members of that caretaker government are almost entirely drawn from HTS. 
there's uh, a lot of, of concern among other opposition groups, among Syrian civil society, among members of, of uh, minorities, that HTS so far has promised inclusion, but has not delivered inclusion. And, and so that's, that's a little troubling. I, I really wonder what kind of, of governing structure HTS has in mind for the country as a whole. And and I, I think it's too soon, really, to try to speculate about what that might look like. I can imagine that HTS might be prepared to accept a degree of local autonomy, a degree of decentralization, for instance, uh, along the, the coastal areas where Alawites uh, are, are prominent, or in Kurdish areas, uh, for example, Druze areas. But but we really don't have any sense yet of of where HTS might be headed, other than this very early inclination to be the ones who are calling the shots. And, and that, that's a little nervous making. Yeah. Although one thing, and again, we can look at everything here sort of for a glimmer of hope or, or, or a ominous sign, but, but, you know, saying that it's a six month interim or an interim government through March is a sign that they expect something to follow that. So that there is, you know, there's a sign, there is a structure, that could follow that. I have a bigger question that may or may not relate to that directly in your mind. Uh, you talk about 13 year uh, civil war in Syria. It dates back to the Arab Spring. How do you think people are feeling about this in Egypt and elsewhere? Uh, I've seen a lot on social media uh, celebrating the resurgence of the Arab Spring following the collapse of the Assad regime, suggesting it never ended suggesting that what we've seen in Syria could serve as a template for uh, for other countries. I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, I'm not so sure, both because we don't find the kind of territorial fragmentation uh, in other countries that we do in, in Syria. Certainly that exists in Yemen. But Yemen is consolidating uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a division between the Houthis on one hand and the internationally recognized government on the other. The same is true in Libya, where we have now a, a, a more or less stable status quo, where the country is divided between the internationally recognized government in Tripoli and the government of Khalifa Haftar in Benghazi. So I don't I, I don't know that that a serious style uh, possibility is out of the question in other cases, but it doesn't strike me as a relevant comparison for, say, Egypt, uh, which, you know, is an obvious case to consider if we're thinking about the resurgence of, of an Arab Spring like protest movement for Algeria, um, for Tunisia. I, 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 I would love to think that we now have a greater scope to imagine transitions away from autocracy in those cases. I'm just, I'm just not sure that's true. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I go to you, Corey, and then Rosa for any question for Steve or last comment. Yeah, Steve, I'd love to know whether you think the brittleness at the end that the Assad regime um, demonstrated is there any other authoritarian government in the region that not because of geography, but but because of authoritarian brittleness, is at risk in the way the Assad regime was? You know, un unfortunately, what we've seen since 2011 is a shift in, in the authoritarian governance in the region in which I think it's become um, even harsher, more intrusive, more repressive, uh, more adept at using surveillance technologies to track and suppress expression of dissent. So, you know, we look at the Gulf, for example, and, and those regimes have really substantially upgraded their authoritarian capabilities. I think the same is true in Egypt. You know, Tunisia now seems to be moving in that direction. So, so when I look around, you know, it, it seems to me that autocrats learned the lessons of 2011 pretty well and huh. what they learned and, and what they learned is that they need to take additional steps put additional measures in place to demobilize contain surveil suppress their populations they've invested heavily in that over the past 13 years and 
that has mattered. I think it has diminished prospects for new kinds of mass protest movements to emerge. It was so interesting to me that um, political reform was nowhere among the tools described by the authoritarians in the region. Well, exactly, because I think they recognize that political reform would open the door to all kinds of challenges to their authority. Um, and they have, they have been determined to prevent those kinds of openings from emerging. Yeah. Rosa, last question, comment? Yeah, this is a question. I, you know, Steve, feel free to duck this if you want, and and I'll make Corey and David answer it. But but it's it's really in some ways a U.S. politics question. I'm curious about what, if any, impact we think this will have on uh, the incoming Trump administration's approach to the region, approach to Russia. Obviously, among other things, this is a setback for the Russians. Um, kind of a bad moment for them. You know, how does that affect? Uh, uh, what we think they're likely to do uh, in terms of Ukraine. And, and you know, I realize that the, the honest answer for everybody is going to be who the hell knows because nobody ever knows what they're going to do. But I'm, I'm just curious if any of you have, have thoughts about uh, whether this is going to change what we're likely to see from the Trump administration in the first days and weeks in office. You know, it's a really great question, and I've been been wondering and hoping that the incoming administration is reassessing uh, U.S. the U.S. approach to Syria because you know Trump has all along said the conflict is is not something the U.S. should should involve be involved with. It's not a priority for us. We should stay out of it. Well, there isn't a conflict at the moment. There's a transition, and uh, it may be the case that that. Trump consider, continues to view Syria as a third order priority and, and won't do anything to, to engage. But there's an opportunity now without thinking about military intervention of any kind for the U.S. to take some steps that could help support a smoother transition. For example, by, by lifting a number of the economic sanctions that have, that have isolated Syria's economy. So I'd like to think that this is a moment when when we might see some shifts in in how the uh, the future Trump administration thinks about you know places like Syria, but as you said, it's it's really hard to know. Just as a, a final question, just as we're here to wrap it up, but I, I don't want to leave it hanging. Uh, the, the, there has been apparently some discussion at the higher levels of the Biden administration about. Um, reclassifying HTS, not as a terrorist group. Well, what do you think of that? I, I think it's, it's a positive step. I'm, I'm glad those, those discussions are happening. And they're happening, by the way, in the EU and, and the UK as well. So we're not alone. But the Biden administration has, I think, quite appropriately adopted a wait and see attitude on this. They're not approaching it as, as, as a decision they need to take urgently. But it's difficult to imagine that the U.S. could engage directly in any way as long as Syria is being governed by a designated terrorist group. And that has all kinds of implications, including in terms of our ability to provide humanitarian assistance. So given the changes we've seen in HTS, given the statements that have come out of HTS since Assad fell, given the assurances HTS has made to minorities, to women, um, its commitment to to inclusion, all those kinds of of, of things we've seen, I I I I think the moment is right to begin reconsidering the the designation of HDS. But I also agree that it's still pretty early days, and it 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 would behoove the Biden administration to to hold off for a bit. It's very frustrating to have a conversation for thirty minutes about something we could talk about for several days. Um, but I think we are very fortunate, once again, to have a great expert like Steve join us and, of course, to have the insights of Rosa and Corey. I just hope that everybody out there listening realizes that Syria is not something far away that doesn't connect to them. It connects to every country in the region. If you care about those, it's relevant. It connects to Europe with regard to uh, flows of, of uh, refugees connects to the United States and our interests in the region. It's really, really a very significant development. And although we don't have a lot of clarity about the future, um, uh, it's a, a remarkable set of developments. And we're fortunate to be able to have 
uh, the kind of insights that we've gotten today from Steve. So thank you. And Rosa and Corey. Uh, and of course, we'll keep following this each and every day as we go forward. And uh, we hope that uh, that you will join us. We'll even be talking about it a little bit more on our show tomorrow. So join us on that. Until then, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.